Um, the Bell inequality could be violated and quantum physics could stay intact if you allowed particles to communicate with each other faster than the speed of light. Now this would violate special relativity, but quantum mechanics would still be left intact and the notion that there is an underlying reality would be left intact if you allowed particles to communicate with each other faster than the speed of light. Well, as it turns out, the Leggett inequality sort of takes away the last amount of freedom, the last degree of freedom that was still left over in the Bell inequality that I was just talking about. And this is a, a diagram of the Leggett inequality taken from New Scientist magazine. And it's a fairly complicated one in that you're not measuring simply uh, a spin here and a spin there from entangled particles. You're taking entangled particles, measuring a spin here, a spin there, and then you're measuring three elliptical polarization angles. And I don't want to go into that, in part because it would be way above the level of this talk, and secondly, because I don't fully understand this yet, because this has not been clarified in any qualitative way in the article in New Scientist, nor in the, uh, anything I've, I've found since that has given me an adequate explanation for what, this, what the details of this are. But the point is that it's been hailed as the both by the, the group in Vienna that made the measurement and my new scientist magazine, as pretty much ruling out not only non-locality, but also realism as a, uh, an explanation for how particles can be correlated with each other. And yet quantum mechanics predicts that the relationships between these measurements that you make are rather different quantum mechanically than they are if you assume that the particles could communicate with each other or that they would be if the particles really have these properties and you're simply measuring them, but you're not creating anything when you make the measurement, you're making a real objective measurement. So recent experiments led by the group at the University of Vienna, Austria, provide the most compelling evidence yet that there is no objective reality beyond what we observe. So it's really the observation, the observation that creates the reality. And what they found is that Leggett's inequality is violated as well as Bell's. Even if you allow for instantaneous influences, quantum measurements do not fit with the idea of an objective reality. So as they say in, in the magazine, rather than passively observing it, we in fact create reality. Now if quantum theory denies a the straightforward physical reality of atoms, it would also seem to deny the straightforward physical reality of chairs, which are made of atoms. Now we like to think that the world can be divided into quantum and classical realms, and in fact that's sort of the way physics operates practically. But in fact, there really is you know, only one reality here. And the transition from quantum to macro reality is not, not a real one. In fact, it's not, not even really blurry. It's, there's one continuous law of physics you know, that takes us from one level to the other. You can have quantum ob objects that are very large. For example, there is a, a gravitational wave detecting bar that weighs about a ton that has to be analyzed using quantum mechanics because of the, the precision of what you're looking for and the precision of knowledge of the, 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 um, the, 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 well, of that bar itself. So a quantum object is not necessarily one that's tiny. It can be a huge thing the size of a, well, a one ton uh, barbell. Prior to the Leggett experiment, it was thought that observation of one object can instantaneously influence the behavior of another object, another one that's greatly distant, even if no physical force connects the two, well, it's even more mysterious now because what these experiments are telling us, the Leggett experiments, is that consciousness is creating both realities via observation. Now, the, the last thing that is uh, rather mysterious about quantum physics and this ruling out of the notion that the particles can communicate with each other or that there is some realism in the particles that we're measuring rather than being created at the point of measurement, at the moment of measurement, is that the observation also creates a back history. It's possible for objects to say, this is a, a wheel or time delay experiment that I'm thinking of. If you let a, say, uh, a quantum object encounter a, with an effectively a beam splitter where it can be divided and go along two possible paths, then there are two things that can happen. If the object splits in half and goes along two paths, then it's possible that these two paths, when the objects emerge, will interfere with each other and you will get an interference pattern. And so if you get an interference pattern, then you know that the object has been split at some point and gone off along two parallel paths, and therefore uh, this shows the interference pattern that, that is a signature of that having happened. The alternative is that the particle can go along one path or the other, and you can then detect which path it emerges from when you make your measurement. But whether, you, whether the particle goes along one path 
splits and then along both of them and interferes, or whether it goes along a path, doesn't split, but goes along A or B, that de depends upon what measurement you make down here. So you determine down here when you make the measurement what the particle does back here when it reaches the beam splitter. Well, in fact, what you've done is sort of create a backwards in time causation because the object has to do what you measure. If you decide to detect which slit the object comes out of, then it's not possible for that object to have split in two back here because that's not consistent with what you measure. If you make a measurement that gets an interference pattern, then that demonstrates that the object has gone along two paths after it's gone through the beam splitter, but the object did that back here. And it's possible for you to not make your decision on which measurement you're going to make until after the object has passed that point of no return. So once again, it's the observation that creates the reality, and in fact, even creates the back history for that reality. So the point of all of this is that it certainly looks as if there's evidence coming out of the physics lab, not for God, but for the notion that consciousness is creating reality at the level of quantum physics. And if it's creating reality at the level of quantum physics, then, by implication, the rest of reality somehow also is being created by consciousness. And I think consciousness is actually the, the formative element behind the universe. It's not that somehow it's an epiphenomenon coming out of our brains, not a matter of biochemistry taking place in here, but rather it's consciousness that is the ultimate reality out of which everything else has come. And that is my explanation for why the universe is finely tuned. It's not certainly a proof by any means. If you want to go away from this talk thinking there is a multiverse of universes, and ours is not special, we're just one of an ensemble, that's fine, it's equally logical, it's equally rational, but I don't think it has any advantage over the notion that it's consciousness all the way behind the universe. Thank you. Okay, we have a... Nice long time for questions. Um, and, uh, okay, I'll start with the guy I saw first. My name is Kenny Arnett. I'm wondering what happens on a lifeless planet to quantum mechanics, where there is no consciousness around. Never having been on, on a lifeless planet, I don't know. Um, you've, raised a good, you've raised a question, though, that, that, that I think deserves an answer. Let me open up my computer again, because after all, I've got about a couple of minutes of extra time because I went early, didn't I? So, let's see if I can find a slide here that I prepared as a possible response to a question that might have come up like that. The von Neumann chain. The question is, do you really need an observer, or can, can anything... And anything that interacts with a quantum situation constitute a measurement. And this question was looked at rather carefully back in 1932 already by John von Neumann. John von Neumann was a mathematical genius. He was one of the people that invented the, the operator analysis of quantum mechanics, and the operator, operator formalism of quantum mechanics. And uh, what he showed was that quantum theory makes physics encounters with consciousness inevitable. So he considered an apparatus, a measuring apparatus, like a Geiger counter. And he said, okay, now that Geiger counter, whether it goes off or not, let's see for a second here. Ah, he takes a measuring apparatus that would look at whether or not, say, um, uh, a quantum event is happening in a given box. And you could argue, well, that Geiger counter's measurement is really equivalent to an observer looking at that. And the Geiger counter, of course, is not conscious. So can a Geiger counter substitute for a human being? His answer was no. What happens is that the Geiger counter's, the Geiger counter's state becomes, becomes entangled with the state of the, the quantum situation it's trying to measure. If you then try to put a detector to measure whether the Geiger counter has registered or not, then that detector becomes entangled with, becomes superimposed with, quantum mechanically, with the Geiger counter, the detector with the Geiger counter, the Geiger counter with the quantum object. And the whole thing forms a chain. And the chain is not broken until a conscious observer decides to make a measurement. And I see a hand going up in the back there. It's probably going to challenge that interpretation. But this von Neumann chain is the, the explanation or the rationalization or the rationale, I should say, I suppose more realistically, the rationale for why it really takes an observer to make a quantum event happen and to break the, uh, well, to bring about the decoherence of the state. 
Dick Schaub. Um, let me just 